I think this is the right place to talk about Ukraine since we are in one of three most important cities for Vladimir Putin's power. I hope it's not offensive for Chelsea London fans, even though I have to admit the, to chant Roman Abramovich during, minute, minute, during a minute of silence devoted to the victims of the war, it was a bit nasty. So we can agree, blue is the color, football is the game, even though today blue and yellow is the color and freedom is the game. Uh, now, uh, Professor Ash, welcome. Nice to be with you. Uh, we, we, we have the war, we have the largest refugee crisis after Second World, World War II. What's the significance, what's the significance of this um, unfolding Ukrainian events and, so to speak, history-breaking news that we are watching on our TV screens every day? So, first of all, it's great to be with you and it's always a pleasure to talk to Thomas Lees, and so I hope you will interrupt me. Um, three years ago, I started writing a history of contemporary Europe. It starts in 1945, and I asked the question at the end of the chapter whether Europe was fated to go all the way back. I could not have imagined that just three years later, we would be almost all the way back from the horrors of the Second World War. Because let's make no mistake, what's happening as we speak in Ukraine, a war of occupation, recolonization, and terror, because terror is now the Russian tactic, it is to terrorize the population, is Poland in the autumn of 1939. Not yet the Holocaust, but we're almost all the way back. And I believe, I mean, on the historical significance, I believe, um, although one has to be careful with instant judgments, that this is a definitive end of what I call the post-wall period, the period that started with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Soviet Union, the post-Cold War period. But that period definitively ended on the 24th of February 2022, and we're now in a new period. If I may, though, um, Tomasz, for me, the immediate question is, what can we actually do to help the Ukrainians in their absolutely heroic, extraordinary military and civil resistance. And President and Zelensky... Is... Okay, so President Zelensky gives us the answer on Twitter. If anyone in the audience is not following President Zelensky's Twitter feed, please do so at once. Because from all his conversations, he says military support, sanctions, and the Prospect of EU members. There are three things. And in each of them, there's still more we can do. I mean, the military support has been impressive. I have to say, I'm no fan of the UK government, this UK government, but they were pretty early on the case. They've trained more than 20,000 Ukrainian soldiers. They sent in anti tank weapons. Poland has been good. The US has been good. The question is, what more? And we still do. Maybe we'll talk about the MiG-29, talk about the no-fly zone. What we can clearly do more is sanctions. I mean, the package has been very big. Sanctioning a central bank is unprecedented. But there are two big things where we've been controlled. One is, you hinted at it, London grab. The UK government should have got serious about sanctioning the dirty Russian money in London in 2014. But it's absolutely shocking that they're still giving the oligarchs and others the days they need to put their assets. So that's point number one. Point number two, oil and gas. And here it's Germany and Italy and some East European countries. But, you know, we have to be very clear. While Russia is prosecuting a war of terror on Ukraine, when a German citizen or an Italian citizen pay their heating bill, they're essentially paying into the war chest of Vladimir Putin. That's a shocking fact. So I think oil and gas, we have to talk about how we do it. Is it feasible? What do we do when we get to the winter? But I think that's a big one. And then the third one, quickly, isn't it astonishing that in the middle of a war, 
when President Zelensky is hourly in risk of his life from assassination commandos, Russian assassination commandos, he's still talking about the prospect of EU membership. And what the EU leaders said in Versailles yesterday, I thought was deeply disappointing. Not surprising, but deeply disappointing. Because as you know very well, the EU is expert at pretending to say yes, while in fact saying no. I talked to Jose Manuel Barroso, the European Commission president, in 2005 after the Orange Revolution. And I said, why can you not now declare want Ukraine to be a member of the EU? And his answer was, I would immediately be slapped down by two major member states, France and Germany. And the problem is, 17 years later, that is effectively where we still are. If they were honest, the leaders of many West European EU member states, including France, Germany, the Netherlands, would say that they don't actually want to have Ukraine as a member of the EU. So we're given this total waffle about being a member of the European family. Ukraine does not need Ursula von der Leyen to tell it that it's a member of the European family or having a European perspective. So I think that's something where we need to keep pressing because that is, the fact that Zelensky keeps talking about it means that it has great significance. And just on that point, doing that, you may say, what's the use of this? Well, number one, short term, major symbolic gesture, right? Something they really want. Number two, medium term. If we think about how this war ends, I mean, I still hope for a miracle on the Dnieper. I still hope, hope against hope that the Ukrainians can win. But most likely neither side will be able to win. And then the question is, what would be the really bitter peace deal? And Zelensky would have to make concessions, I'm afraid. He would probably have to concede, he's already hinted at it, non-NATO neutrality, maybe even some de facto recognition of territorial concessions. The, the promise that you are a candidate for EU membership at least gives you one big win. And long term, long term, it gives an answer to the question, how do we see the future of Europe in 10 to 20 years time? Because otherwise, ultimately, this means a new Yalta. Ultimately, it does mean the EU accepting a new division of Europe along the eastern frontier of the EU and NATO. Uh, and those countries like Belarus and Moldova and Ukraine and Georgia being left in a never-never a land, a zone of insecurity. And that's not something we want to see. It would be very heartwarming to think, you know, let's do whatever we can for the Ukrainians, let's send the troops. Uh, but how would you define what should be and what are the real limits of Western engagement in Ukraine, considering the great majority of people of the West probably don't want to die for Kiev in the same way people 85 years ago didn't want to die for Gdańsk? Moria for Danzig was the famous uh, headline in a French newspaper, and you're quite right, people are not prepared to die for Kiev. Um, I think it's very interesting in that perspective to see the discussion in Poland at the moment. Um, I remember the great Bronisław Gieremek telling me that as a child, he stood in front, in a crowd in front of the French and British embassies in Warsaw to applaud when Britain went to war for Poland in September 1939, and then the bitter disappointment. I myself, when I first started coming to Poland, kept hearing this word Yalta, Yalta, Yalta. You betrayed us at Yalta. But now Poland is a part of the West. And, and it's not so easy to work out what you're going to do. So if you look at the discussion around the MiG-29s, I mean, I wish the MiG-29s were already in Kiev. But 
actually, when push came to shove, Poland was only prepared, and it was very badly handled, by the way, but Poland was only prepared, and I think quite rightly, in the context of the whole NATO alliance. What we are not going to do is a no-fly zone, because that does mean going to war with, with Russia, and the NATO are not prepared to go to war with Russia, which is why, since what we're going to do militarily meets that limit, um, I mean, I think we can still send in very powerful anti-aircraft weapons, shoulder head or on vehicles, but not actually no-fly zone. We have to do more on the other fronts, more on sanctions, more on the EU perspective, of course, more on refugees. Some people say that this is a defining moment, not just for Ukraine, for Russia, but also for the West and, 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 and for Europe. Would you agree? And if yes, in what sense defining? Well, I think almost self-evidently it's a defining moment because it's the end of the post-Cold War era, the end of all our illusions about our relationship with Russia, at least in the short to medium term. And people are beginning to understand, I think I would put it like this, that freedom is not a process. Freedom is a struggle. Freedom has to be fought for peacefully every day, but it need be also militarily. And so you're going to see a transformation in German foreign and security policy. The increase in German defense expenditure, which means that in 10 years' time, it will be one of the largest and probably most effective armies in, in, in Europe. Um, so, so I think it's transformative in the way people think about Europe as a three-dimensional power, not just economic and cultural power, but military power. I think it's transformational in people understanding that we need the whole West, not just Europe. My fear is that it'll be transformation for those of us who are inside, but not for those who are still out in the cold, i.e. Poland's immediate Eastern neighbors. You know, I, I couldn't help thinking when we had that last discussion with our Polish colleagues talking about issues around ESG and gender representation and investment, all very important issues. But try to imagine that Poland was not in NATO and the EU. You'd be having a very different conversation in Poland today. A couple of days ago, you wrote that the proper response to the war should be not just a resistance, but also inspiration. What do you mean by inspiration? Well, I mean, look, the inspiration is coming to us from the Ukrainians. Um, I think many of us have friends who are lawyers, bankers, teachers, professors, and who are now you know, in the territorial defense at this moment, standing up ready to defend Kiev. And uh, Volodymyr Zelensky has been an inspirational leader. The Winston Churchill of Ukraine, cometh the moment, cometh the man. So the inspiration is coming from there. I want to get some inspiration coming the other way. And I don't just mean standing ovations for the Ukrainian ambassador and you know, orchestras playing the Ukrainian anthem. Uh, and for me, an inspirational gesture would be the European Union leaping over its shadow, not responding in its kind of old bureaucratic way, but saying in this historic existential moment for Europe, we say you are a candidate for membership of the Union. We know it'll take a long time. We know it'll be a long process. But if you're risking your, your life, at least we're prepared to take that risk. That, I think, would be at least one inspirational moment. We have a lot of corporate people here, and they know that every crisis is also an opportunity and a an chance. Do you see this war as a chance for renewal of Europe and European projects, considering that suddenly we see that Europe is worth fighting for and dying for? Well... Yes, I do. I think that, you know, as has often been said, in the long term, Vladimir Putin may achieve the precise opposite of everything he hopes for. 
he will be the consolidator, already is the consolidator of Ukrainian national identity and unity. He's the consolidator of the European Union. He's brought NATO weapons to his own frontier and to some extent the consolidator of the unity of the West. So I think that there is an opportunity. But I say again, that's an opportunity for us to work safely inside NATO and the EU. And by the way, thank God we did the big EU enlargement and the big NATO enlargement. Imagine where Poland would be or Estonia would be if you were not in NATO and the EU today. So don't listen to anyone who says this is because of, because of NATO enlargement. I mean, you know, by the way, who would be so naive as to imagine that if only we hadn't done NATO enlargement, nice Mr. Putin would be sitting there happily in the Kremlin, eating his Palmeni um, and watching a sovereign, independent, democratic Ukraine emerging on his frontier. Nothing of the kind. Don't let anyone tell you NATO enlargement was the cause of this war. This war shows us how right we were to enlarge NATO. But we have to have an answer for the rest of Europe, the Europe between the EU and Russia, and long term for Russia. And for me, that answer is still Europe whole, free, and at peace. It is still long term the enlargement of the EU and the enlargement of NATO. Ultimately, I would argue, let's remain true to the vision of Europe whole and free which means that even a democratic Russia with President Alexei Navalny could become a member of NATO. As we all know, uh, historical comparisons are tricky and risky. So would you agree with people who say, you know, Putin is a new Hitler, Zelensky is a new Churchill, basically you said this, and war in Ukraine is sort of battle of Britain again? So, um, all historical analogies are useful up to a point, and that is perfect. So obviously they're, they're figures of speech in a way. Um, if only what is happening to Kiev were just the Battle of Britain, because remember, Britain was not an occupied country. The, the Wehrmacht was not in Kent, right? It was a frightful bombing attack, but um, we had our own country. So actually, I think the battle for Kiev is more like the battle for Warsaw in 1939 than the battle of Britain, if you want an analogy. Do I think that analogy is apt? Well, for, I would say this, for 77 years, people have been making comparisons with Adolf Hitler, and they've always been hyperbole. They've always been over the top. Now, for the first time, I would say that a comparison between Vladimir Putin and the Adolf Hitler of 1939, I say again, not the Adolf Hitler yet of the Holocaust, although God knows what he's capable of, and we, we should be prepared for worse things to come. But I think an analogy with Hitler in 1939 is for the first time appropriate. You enthusiastically support the idea of inclusion Ukraine into the European Union, but how would you respond to people who say, well, look at Poland, look at Hungary, look at what's going on with the rule of law there. Do we really need another Eastern Europeans here to destroy our project? So you're so right. There are a hell of a lot of people, and I hope people in Poland are aware of this, inside the European Union who are actually privately saying that. And I've had these conversations with people, French, Spanish, Italian, who say, why on earth did we bring the Poles and the Hungarians in in the first place? It was a great mistake. You know, if it hadn't been for the war in Ukraine, I think you and I would have spent quite a bit of time talking about the erosion of liberal democracy in Poland and Hungary. So I, I, I would see, I, I would make two points on this. First of all, I did see in President Duda's speech to the same on the 23rd anniversary of Poland's accession to NATO, the hope 
that at last we could get beyond the hyperpolarization of Polish politics, which has been such a curse for the last however many years. I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not naive. I don't think that's probable. But if ever there was a time when Poles have to get together, it's now. But that cannot be at the cost of restoring liberal democracy. Uh, and here I have a fear, which is that the transformed geopolitical context, the drama of the war in Ukraine, will tempt many people in Western Europe, in the European Union, to say, um, well, we have other things to worry about now. Let's not worry so much about rule of law and democracy in Poland and Hungary. Viktor Orban may be a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch, right? So I do think we have to keep the focus also on issues around rule of law, media freedom, liberal democracy in um, Poland and Hungary. I'm looking forward to the day when, when you're the chief editor of KPLP, then, then, then I'll know that democracy in, in Poland is secure. Um, but what we need for that is stronger internal enforcement mechanisms inside the EU. And the key to that is to continue to try and make a link between the money from the EU and the values of the EU. Yeah. And wouldn't you be afraid that uh, the biggest beneficiaries of the war could be authoritarian leaders in Eastern Europe who pay lip service to Europe, to the European Union, condemn Vladimir Putin, but at the same time push with Putinization of Poland and actually these days they are demolishing what is left from the rule of law in Poland. So that is precisely what I was trying to say, that I'm afraid that that might happen and that they might get away with it for the reasons I gave, because, you know, people in, in Western Europe and uh, elsewhere would be saying, well, there are more important things. So that it, Hungary has an election on the 3rd of April. They have achieved what, unfortunately, the Polish opposition has not yet achieved. They have a united opposition. They have a rather good candidate, Peter Matizoy, who's a liberal conservative, which is a very good thing to go up against Viktor Orban. He, 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 he wonderfully says that um, I am everything that Viktor Orban pretends to be. And uh, I shall be going to Budapest for that, because I want to make sure we keep the spotlight uh, on that opportunity. And I think the Polish opposition has a lot of work to do uh, to make sure there really is a, is a united opposition and to keep the focus of the EU on, on, on that issue. A couple of years ago, I asked you, how do you see the future of Poland? And you told me, I'm the optimist of the heart and pessimist of the mind. And when it comes to Ukraine, how, you see, how do you see the future? So, uh, the absolute best place with the optimism of my heart is a miracle on the table, like the miracle on the vistula. Uh, the, 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 the achievement of the Ukrainian army and the Ukrainian civil resistance has been so extraordinary. And by the way, the Russian campaign has been so unbelievably incompetent thus far that that would be the, the, the best case of the heart. The best case of the head is, I'm afraid, that Putin will continue to escalate. We're already seeing the techniques used in Chechnya and Syria now being used in the heart of Europe, bombardment and siege, and we have to be prepared even for the use of chemical weapons. But then the analogy would be the winter war between Finland and the Soviet Union, which, as you know, lasted for many months ended with a peace treaty in which Stalin recognized that he'd got a bloody nose and the Finns had to make painful concessions. They had to give up 9% of their pre-war territory, but Finland remained essentially a democratic independent country, although neutralized. And that I think is still the best case to play for. At the beginning, I asked you about historical significance of this event, this war, 
and as you told us, we have to be cautious with, with analogies, but how would you compare the significance of this event comparing to the to, to historical significance of, of Solidarity Revolution in Poland, about which you, you wrote a famous book? So, I mean, of course, one thinks of that in these days. And by the way, I think of it particularly looking at the amazingly powerful civil resistance in Belarus, as well as in Ukraine, which uh, have strong echoes of Solidarność. But there is a difference because um, Solidarność punched the first hole in the Berlin Wall. I mean, it was the 10 years of the Solidarity struggle ended with a great triumph in the Velvet Revolutions and the end of the communist rule in East Central Europe and the end of the Cold War. And I'm afraid it's difficult to have the same optimism about these events. Um, it's not at all clear which direction they're heading in, but they could be preparing us for things that are actually worse. Unfortunately, we run out of time. As always, great honor and great pleasure to, to, to talk with Professor Ash. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you, ladies Let and gentlemen. Dziękuję bardzo, daję mikro. Dziękujemy.